You're laying down. You're the first guest. I think I could see their, their feet. Looks like you're laying down, right? You're very comfortable. I yeah. like this. Well, but the thing is, but you've got to remember something. You empowered yourself more than a lot of other people would. Hello and welcome to Here's the Pitch. I'm your YouTube friend Brad and it's sponsored by Masses Restaurants in St. Louis. Five locations. STLMasses.com is their website. Go there. It's Mike Bocchetti. Mike, hello. Hey Brad, thank you for having me, first of all. And I just was watching you. First of all, people that are charitable have great stuff happen to them. Well, I, I wasn't going to start with this, but since we just sort of landed on it, the Artie Lang show is what we're talking about. It was on Direct TV for many years. You were the co-host. Then you went and you co-hosted the Halfway House. I'm privileged to talk to you too because you have a nice, great show and a lot of fun people and cool people on here. But thank you. Yeah, it was. Uh, I know Artie since like 2003. How did you guys hook up? How did that even happen? Was it the Stern Show? You know, it's so funny in this business, right? How things just evolve sometimes without even. You know, because you can work hard for years and just focus on one thing and it may never happen. And you could just be out there one day and somebody sees something and just get into something. Like, I'll tell you how it happened because I was doing comedy for 11 years, 1992 to 2003. I was doing stuff here and there, not a lot of things, right? And then the last comic standard came along, 2003, the first season. My friend Ross Mark and Al Martin got me on the show. And what happened was, Sal from the Howard Stern Show was a good friend of me, right? I didn't know him at the time. He was starting to do comedy. He seen me at a comedy thing, and he goes, hey, man, I seen you on the last comic. He goes, John Melendez loves you. Do you want to talk with us? Okay. Now, there's a cynical side of me, too, after being in this for 11 years. You know, people tell you all kinds of stuff and nonsense, like, you know, what I'm this and that. I'm like, so I think it would a grain of salt, right? The next day, I get a phone call. With an unrestricted number, so I don't know who this is. I pick it up, and I go, I go, he goes, this is Sal. Goes, Sal who? He goes, Sal from the Stern Show. I go, he goes, what do you think? I can not call you back and pull your chain? I go, I thought so. Because <laughs> I didn't really know him. So then he met, introduced me to John. We started a tour. Then I did a gig with Audie in 2003, and he became a friend of me. But the thing about him is, like, him and Nick DiPaolo, other friends that have, like, those guys, I never ask my friends for anything, really. Because that's why I'm still friends with them. Because, I mean, you know how many people must ask Audie and Nick and, and other people on Friends, but we hook them up, do this, do that, you know what I mean? That they really don't know who their real friends are, you know what I mean? So I never bother them for anything. And I've been super blessed they like me as a person and they, and they help me with stuff. But, Brad, the surreal thing is becoming a friend of John Melendez and Audie, because, I mean, people have known both those guys for years. You know? They had millions of fans, right? And being friends with them in the beginning was weird because it was kind of surreal having celebrities as friends when you really, you know what I mean? And it was kind of awkward at the same time, you know what I mean? I, I didn't know what to say around them, you know? But one day John told me, and so did Audie, he goes, I go, you know, you guys are famous, you got money, you got, I can't do anything from you. And you know what this other me? We don't care, we love you, you're our friend. And that's cemented with me with that, you know? And I don't bother them. There's no need to, because you know what? It's about talent, it's about working hard on this, working smart. And it's also about being a cool person. It was Sal. You, you get a call from Sal. You have to believe you're being pranked because that's all he does, right? You think? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought he goes, no, I'm not pranking you, buddy. He goes, I'm your friend. The first gig we ever did together was it was really cool. It was John Melendez, Sal, myself, Nick DiPaolo, and Rascals in uh, Cherry Hill. It was fun. And then we started touring. But one gig I really got to tell you about, which is, which is a nightmare, but it turned out to be terrific. It was myself, John, the late Otto from Otto and George, uh, Nick, Audie, Sal, and me. We did a gig at a place called the Electric Factory in Philly. Now, Philly I like, but they're crazy with their sports. And their, their, their nut burgers over there, right? And the thing is, I we had a gig we were doing, right? It was at the Electric Factory. And it was, we were supposed to be about 8 at night. You know what happened? It's so crazy. This is 2003, December. We had the worst, one of the worst snowstorms on the East Coast in years. It took us four and a half hours to fill it in, in, in John's truck. We got there, Brad. The crowd was like a monster truck rally, brutal, yelling, fighting with people. Some guy got arrested in the audience on stage. You know? The cops are pulling it out of there. It's like, 
But it was we some of the stuff we talked about in the car could have been like five Netflix specials. The comedy came out of the Nick Audie, John's mouth and Otto. It was, it was insane, but that's how we became friends. And and the thing is, I it's not like the kind of friendship I have with Audie is it's not like I talk to him every day. Wish I did, but I don't want to bother him like that. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people will be like up his butt and and, and the thing is people know as well after a while. I mean, you know, I, when I seen your show, I liked it, Mike, because you're a real guy like I am and all your guests thought is no nonsense. You have a very memorable face. I feel like you should be in a lot of films. Um, I've done stuff. I've done, I've, I've did some stuff for Adult Swim, which I love. I did some commercials, you know what I mean, here and there, various things. I wish I could ever do more, but it, you know what? I've been auditioning a lot, but you know what? With auditions, it's the luck of the draw. I get that. No, it's probably a tough thing. We talked about Artie in the show. I'm going to ask more a little bit about those times being the co-host because he, he, you were kind of his Ed McMahon, but kind of this, uh, you know, very filthy, angry <laughs> Ed McMahon. Oh, you, yeah. you kind of created a character, right? I mean, was that when you got in Nick, there? Did you Nick want? Nick gave me a nickname. It's funny you mentioned Ed McMahon. Nick gave me a nickname. He called me well-fed McMahon because <laughs> I was fat. <laughs> that right? It was fun because. They were a great combination, Nick and Audie, because like they have two different styles of comedy. Because first of all, Audie comes from more of an improv acting background than Nick does, right? And Nick is a great writer. He comes from, I mean, he would come to the show super early and have a notebook in his hand and start writing bits for the show, for the stand-up. I mean, he's a workaholic when it comes to writing. And it had two different styles of working together. That's why, you know, it was, it was wild because, and they're like, uh, they are, uh, I told them to, they should be they should be on Broadway's uh, Oscar Madison to Felix Songa. Nick would be a perfect Felix Songa to Audie's Oscar Madison. <laughs> but but I think Nick would be a little more of an uptight Audie, uptight Felix. But he'd be awesome. You you wrote a lot of jokes. Did you write jokes for other people? Were you a joke writer type person? And did you have some famous I stories? You know what? I thought about it a couple of times. I never really wrote for anybody. I like writing for me because it's just people wanted to write for me, and I was like. I was like, you know what? I was really honored by it, but I'm like, you know what? I, I, I don't know if anybody knows. You don't know anybody. You don't. I'm sorry for stuff. You don't know. And people can't capture you unless you're you. You know what I mean? They can come close. I just don't like other people writing for me. You said you were going to be really nice on the show, and we were talking about greats of the comedians, Sam Kinison, uh, Norm MacDonald, Richard Pryor, Kathleen Madigan, right? A very, a, a, you're a big fan. Kidding. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking the fifth amendment on this. <laughs> I, I will say, very. This is a true story. Um, yeah, so I guess Kathleen was on uh, uh, Last Comic Standing, right? Was that how you? Oh yeah. She's and she's from St. Louis, where this podcast is based. You can see all the Cardinal stuff. And um, I actually, my mom is a huge fan of her. My mom, I was telling you about her as well. She's 75 and she's sitting and watching a lot of TV these days. She's like, you know, who I'd like you to interview is Kathleen Madigan. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll send her a thing. And her manager was so mean to me in her re reply. So when I saw that you had this little thing with her, I said, well, let's start talking about Kathleen Madigan a little bit. But we well, don't. the thing is, the apple don't fall from the, fall, fall from the tree because it's funny you mentioned this. I was told, so I forgot who it was, but recently I was talking to the comic about how arrogant some people are in this, right? You know what I said? They're that arrogant. I guarantee my, I would bet my life on it that their managers and agents are just as obnoxious as they are. Maybe worse, because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Because what made me mad with her about was uh, I auditioned for last comic season six, I think it was. And, you know, they were nice enough to have me come back and audition. So I got in the room and she was just sitting there like, uh, like this, like a stone cold, like, like, sorry. You're laying down, by the way. I think you're you're, Rush, you're, you're the Mount Rushmore that day, right? And I was doing my picture. She goes, the funniest thing I've ever seen was your headshot. And I'm going to say something like saying, well, fuck you, bitch. I was that close away from saying it on camera. I really didn't even care because, you know, I, I was like, who the hell is, I'm like, you know what? I just didn't like her after that. And I, then I just, you know what? Certain people rub me the wrong way. And I know I should forgive her for it, but. It was supposed to be part of the show, but you know what? She was obnoxious to a lot of other people too. So, it's not really that funny, even though I, she's funny to maybe seventy-five-year-old yeah. women like my mom. She just met the the right people that liked her. You know, it's it's all about 
You know, sometimes it's about who you people are in this. It doesn't, I'll give you a good example, right? We can get signed by CAA tomorrow, right? A huge company like that. It doesn't mean it's going to be anything out of it because number one, they can sign you and not do anything with us. They could be worried about their movie star clients more. They could just send you out and stuff and nothing happens and drop you. It's not, it, it sounds great on paper to have them, but if they do this stuff for you, you'll be gold. But you, the most important thing is what you're doing now it will give you much more clout in the long run by producing your own stuff like this because you don't have to rely on anybody but yourself. And if this gets to where you want it to go, then people will be all over you and you can just say, like, whatever, you know what I mean? You don't have to bother because you took the bull by the horns for sure. That, this is words to live by. Now, if people make fun of me because I stand during these. You're laying down. You're the first guest I think I could see their, their feet. Looks like you're laying down, right? You're very comfortable. I yeah. like this. Well, but the thing is, but you've got to remember something. You empowered yourself more than a lot of other people want. You know what I mean? Because everybody can talk about, oh, I'm going to do a podcast, I'm going to do this, you know what I mean? I'm going to do that. you got to really do it and not care and just get out there because, you know what, if something's good, people will follow you. That's the whole thing. It's about you, the fans. It's about the fans because you've got to just get enough of them because they'll kick the door down there after a while. Well, I think people have enjoyed some of these conversations. I wanted to ask you about your time on the Stern Show because you did you met Sal and then you end up on the Stern Show. Oh, yeah. uh, what was it like for you to go on there and be on there, and then you had to be in a bikini and you had to do some sort of? Uh, it was it was it was freaking incredible because first of all, uh, when I was on Howard the first time in two thousand five, he was still on uh, K Rock. He wasn't on Sirius yet, right? So I got there and I'm nervous, shaking like a leaf because. I was a fan of Howard for years, but I don't know what kind of guy he is. He likes, you know, messing with people and lacing into people. But Sal and everybody told me, look, just listen to him. Don't chime in when you're ready. Don't overrun him. You know, don't be, just be yourself with him, right? He's not going to tell you to shred because you're a friend of ours. And you go, he's just going to have fun with you, right? So I got in there. Howard looked at me. He goes, when was the last time you had a woman? <laughs> I was like, in my 40s, I go, I'll put it this way, Howard. Presidents get shot more than I get laid. That's how he started. <laughs> then he just like started laughing. And you know what happened? This is so cool. One of the people who worked for a show, Ralph the hairdresser, called up and heckled me. And he goes, I don't like this guy, Howie. He's not funny. You know what Howard said? Ralph, shut it up. He goes, I think this guy's funny. He's hanging with us. Leave him alone. Ralph couldn't take it. He hung up on him. I'm like, whoa. Howard stuck up to me the first time on him. Like, this is incredible. And then, you know, he became a, nice to me. So, you know what I did? Uh, that was 2005 of April. I got a, a magazine of, uh, from Mad Magazine, a rare edition. I knew Howard was a friend of Mad Magazine as well. I still got it at home someplace. He had Gary send me, Howard wrote me a handwritten note. He goes, hey, Mike, thank you so much for Mad Magazine. Oh, you're a fan of it as well. He goes, it kept me to a lonely child like yours like as well, Howard. I'm like, whoa. And I still have it at home somewhere. And the thing is, you know, you know what I hate about it now? He really is a nice, a great guy to be interviewed by. And he's very warm. You know what I mean, right? And the thing is, his fans now, I hate that they're picking on him because, first of all, they're like, he's, you know, sell out, A-list, all that kind of stuff. But listen to me. You know as well as I do. We all do. A lot of people in this want to be famous, of course, you know, or whatever. Well, at least well known, right? The thing about Howard is, okay, he goofed on the A-list celebrities for years, hammered them, and you know, mimicked them and belittled them. But there was a person deep down the side of him that wanted to be in that in that community with them because they wouldn't let him in. You know what I mean? I think that was part of it too, because they thought he was just a radio guy. They wouldn't let him in, and I was like, when he started getting like that, I was like, yes, it's number one. People have to evolve in life. He couldn't still be doing fart jokes till he's 85 years old. You know what I mean? He had to change and get married again, change them. And I'm happy that he's an A-list now because it's well-deserved. Look how hard he worked for years. And anybody's going to complain or rag about him, the heck with them. My thing about uh, Stern is I, I've always loved his interviews. So I, I actually... Um, I like that people are starting to understand what a great interviewer he was because even my wife, she's like, oh, you know, she used to listen and she's like, oh, it's all strippers and whores. And I said, you have to hear his interviews. His interviews are great. And I know that he really oh, wants he that to be his sort of, he doesn't want all that other stuff, painting of the boobs. He wants the interviews to be kind of what people remember him for. And uh, he's awesome. Yeah. There's no doubt. He's one of the best interviewers on the planet because he can, he, if you're funny, he'll make you turn into John Belushi. 
in an interview. He's just that good because that's why he knows how to pull it out of people. Tell me about, now you do impressions. I, I, I didn't know that many people did a Miss Doubtfire impression, and I know you get paid for impressions. Tell me where it started and give me a little Miss Doubtfire. I, want, I just want to hear a little bit. Oh, English? An English action? What do you mean, Miss Doubtfire? Just Miss Doubtfire. Oh, Doubtfire, because uh, cause I had the doubt at one time. Yeah, have you ever had this painful as all well, heck? It's like you can't even get out of bed. I feel like blowing my foot off with a shotgun that turned so much. It was horrible, really, right? And, uh, so we were talking about Robin Williams, and Artie goes, look at Boschetti. He's Mrs. Doubtfire. This we call me Mr. Doubtfire, right? So all of a sudden, he goes, look, they dressed me up as her. And I started to do an English action. go, hello, Arthur. How are you? We're going across the pond to have some bangers and match. We're going to get a good fight, a good scuffle. You know, Artie, because, you know, it's just the way it is. You know what I mean, right? And he loved it. And then uh, we just did it. But And the thing about Artie is – uh, Dan Flato, our producer and Artie, developed the weatherman character for me. <laughs> Going outside, it was fun. And, but you know what? It was also like, the, the winter was like horrible in those days, 2012 and 13. I wound up getting sick a couple of, and I have chronic bronchitis since I'm 12, so it was really horrible. But it was fun. One of the most fun times I've ever had on Artie's show, we went to the Super Bowl to New Orleans. Have you ever been to New Orleans? I went there for the Super Bowl when the Rams played in 2002 before they left St. Louis. I, I loved it. It was nice. It's such a great city, right? It's like the food is great. People are mellow to chill, great music. It's like the only thing is it could be a bad area. You've got to watch your back in certain places over there. But otherwise, people are nice. It's, and, and the weird thing about that place is Louisiana to me is a deep south, right? And it's hard to even tell what kind of action they have there because it's neutral. You didn't even know they were from the South, and they were just nice people. And that's the first time they ate, ate gumbo. It was awesome. Well, gumbo is delicious. New Orleans is fun. But I didn't really get to hear Miss Doubtfire. I heard your, your British accent. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's how I did it. Oh, you didn't. I thought you went, hello, or something. But I, you do no, no. little Joe Pesci. I, I like impressions. You're a little Joe Pesci, right? Hey, Brad, you're breaking my balls about Pesci here. What the fuck? What do you call it? I'll smack the back of your skull out with an ashtray, and we'll come to the bank the next day and collect the money. I, lo- I love that. I've you know, you said that. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I love impressions, because if you can do one, it's I do like Kermit the Frog. Hi-ho, Kermit the Frog, here with my oh, folks. Oh. That's all I got. Thank you. That's awesome. I like impressions. I, I like them. Did you, see, did you see The Irishman? No. No, I have not. Oh, it, Pesci should have won, won an Academy Award easily. It was too long. It was too, too, too long. Four hours is well, just too long. I've seen it seven times. I mean, should well, I? It took me 14 days to see it. <laughs> I was going to say. Also, your joke about the presidents, uh, it's in my head. I'm like, all right, well, Kennedy got shot at, Reagan, uh, Lincoln. Was there more? McKinley. Okay. McKinley. Who was the other one that got shot at? It was McKinley. Okay. Uh, McKinley got shot. President McKinley. President McKinley was a Civil War general as well, I think. Okay, so Artie was giving you shit about living with your mom. You still at home with mom, and how's it going there? Yeah, it's good. We, we take care of it. You know what? He always likes to teach me about stuff. But he, he stays with his mom, too, sometimes. What's he talking about? Yeah. I was going to say, there's a lot of bruschetta and bugat or whatever. Did, so did you talk to him during these last months while he was away, or did, did you get a chance to? No, you know what? I, haven't, I had, didn't see him at all. I haven't spoken to him. It was just so good to see him because, and you know, it's really cool. I haven't seen him in almost two years, right? And it was like only two days went by. We just re- reconnect, you know what I mean? Sometimes when you're good friends with people like that, you cannot see them for a while, and then it's like nothing, you know what I mean? Like two days went by, two, even if it was 10 years. Does Does he understand the love that people have for him and the wanting to know that he's doing well? Do you think he gets the feel of the people? I, I emphasized it when I was there. I said, you know what? I go like this. Plenty of people are thrilled that you're back and love you. You don't realize the kind of love people have for you. I told him that. You know, I said, I told him that. I said, we all love you. The people have been really supportive of you. So there's a couple of knuckleheads without even worth thinking about. You know what I mean, right? And he didn't, I, you know what, I think he realizes now. I think he does. Is there a possibility we can get him on this show? I haven't, I haven't had a real chance to get a hold of him. I've used, I want Artie to join me I too, Mike. Because I don't really talk to him directly. I talk to his manager, really. We'll deal. Well, I'll try the same thing. Maybe we'll talk off offline. But Artie's my my one last person because he's you know we've you've seen all these interviews with all the guys from the Stern. I'm a huge fan of the Stern Show, huge fan of yours. We talked Norm. What was the last comic standing when you went on there? Um, what did you expect to get out of that? What did you think was going to happen? 
Um, uh, I don't know. It was last comic was kind of weird because it was a new show like that. And well, I was on there twice, right? 2003 was the first season. 2006 was the fourth season. The first time I only got to the semifinals in New York. The second time we made it out to L.A., which is great. And, and the funny thing is, the judges, the second time, it was really weird because it was Gary Marshall, believe it or not, right? Ken, uh, Gary Marshall, Tim Meadows, and Kathy Griffin. What a combination that is, right? So, you know, if they like you, they call you back out to question you, right? So they go, uh, Kathy Griffin wants Mike Bushel to come back out. So she looked at me, she goes, you're a freak, meaning me. And, you know, you're from the East Coast like me, right? No, I just, I'm a Midwest guy over here. Okay, I didn't know, because, but people from the Midwest are tough, too. They didn't take any nonsense either there, like New York, right? Now, if somebody called you a freak, she said, you're a freak. And now, you know, I was about to say, well, fuck you, SYP, you know what I mean? Right? Because being called a freak isn't exactly cool, right? But what I realized was if they call you a freak in L.A., that means you're golden to them over there. You know what I mean? They like you, right? So then she questioned me. Gary Marshall did. In fact, well, we were shooting uh, last comic. One of Kathy's producers came over to me and she said, you know, she really loved you. And when you do an interview for the D-List, a TV show, I shot that that day over there. So she was very nice to me in the long run. But Gary Marshall was really awesome. Tim Meadows didn't say much. I, I don't know. But you know what? It was fun. And the thing is, I really know what was going to happen because, but it's kind of weird because it was like kind of a quick hit. You know what I mean? Like, you know, people would be famous for a year or so, you know what I mean? Because the reality type thing, you know, tour, make great money across the country, but then it fell. You know what I mean? The only person that really, really got gigantic from last comic and all the people were on, one of the biggest ones, I think he is the biggest one, was Gabriel Iglesias. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He's like doing stadiums now, you know what I mean? Like stuff like that. And everybody else went back to where they were. Or some of them are in this anymore. But one thing about Gabriel is, though, he was really a sweet, nice person. He wasn't an idiot. That's a hard, it's a hard, I remember I watched only the first season, I think. I think Dat Fan was the winner, I think. If I, oh, yeah. Um, but I don't remember ever watching it because I always felt like, there was so much fake laughter. Like you felt like you had to laugh at every, you know, not not as a, f a person, but the the audience, the the judges. They had to give sort of this fake laughter. That's why I always found it funny that Norm went on that show to be a judge, um, because you didn't you wouldn't think that he would laugh at any of this shit. And and he sort of did laugh at people. And I thought, oh, come on, Norm, you don't need to be laughing at that. That wasn't funny. It was weird who they had as judges though, because it was like Norm. Buddy Hackett, Phil Stella, Joe Rogan, it's like a variety. Quan the Sykes, and that's like all ends of the stack, stick. <laughs> you got a little Buddy it Hackett. Really had. You have a little Buddy Hackett in you, I just realized. What's that? You have a little Buddy Hackett in you. I, if, I mean, oh, I'm I sure. Like him. I, so, I so, so wanted to meet him badly for years, right? But that was really crazy. I had the comic mentality, right? Buddy died after the first season started in 2003. You know what my first thought was? Not me said, I hope you got to see my comedy and something that was funny. <laughs> so did you, were you, have you been doing the, the touring and the doing, or not touring, but have you been going to Caroline's and the, and the, you know, the place, are you still uh, doing? Pandemic happened. I haven't been doing anything. But before that you were doing a lot of stand up still? Yeah, definitely. I, I did work from like, I, I toured with a bunch of different people. I toured with, uh, Audie, Sal, John Melendez. I toured with who else? Uh, Nick DiPaolo by himself. We toured. I want to tour with Judah Freelander, you know what I mean? It's just, it's been, it's been cool. And, and the thing is, I'm just, let me take a quick, sorry. This is where Mike takes a drink, puts One on the cap. One of the most fun people I've ever worked with was Judah Freelander from 30 Rock. I know him almost 30 years, right? And that's what I mean by people helping you. Judah created a character for me. He used to do a character called the world champion, right? And he made me his official news reporter. It was so much fun to go to an event with him, interviewing people, right? It was just really cool. And he just created that character for me. Well, you mentioned traveling with Sal a lot. Do you still talk to Sal? I mean, is it Yeah, definitely. I talk to Sal, same Sal as much as I can. How, and how is, how is this? How, is he happy where, I mean, how, I mean, he's got to feel pretty, like the luckiest man in the world, right? Still? Uh, you know what? But he also got a good heart, and he also is a smart guy because 
he really was a real stockbroker on Wall Street for years before he came into this. And he, you know, what do you call it? Just he became a friend. I didn't even know him. I mean, there were people in this business that knew me for years that could have helped me with stuff, never bought it. And he was someone I didn't even know that came along to help me. You know what I mean? It's like, and he's just that kind of guy because he's like a family to me. And I love Sal. He's, you know what it is? The thing is, Sal's very honest. And sometimes people get annoyed at honesty, but I like honesty. Oh, he's a funny guy. He definitely does a, f- a funny job there. So you He has a huge heart, too, because he has a show called Big Meals in Small Places, he does. Yeah, I was on a couple of episodes with him. He put me in there with him. And Sal's the real guy. I mean, you know, and, and the thing is, like, you know, we bonded because he just was very real. You know, and, and like I said, there were plenty of people who could have helped me for 11 years before that. Didn't look to fit. And you know what? Nobody's obligated to help. So I always look at it that way, right? They're not obligated. You're supposed to help yourself in this. But sometimes people can help you if they want to do it. And sometimes it seems like people may put a roadblock in your way, too. So I have that happen, too. Well, you got a good group there, a good group of people helping you, and a good, a funny, a funny, uh, I mean, you're always well, funny. Yeah, it's about like you, you and I are. It's a spirit that counts. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you got a good spirit all the time, you got to keep a bit like, like, well, my mom, she's 83, right? She has the heart disease and leukemia, but she still has an incredibly strong spirit. And you know what? That she keeps you healthy and alive, too. Well, I, my mom's got nine lives. She's got had lung cancer for two years, has battled like wow. a ton here in the last three months. Um, I, and I don't, I don't think, I think cancer is afraid of her. I, I know COVID is. COVID ain't going anywhere near her. But, yeah, it's crazy to watch. Um, and I know that we talked a lot about doing this, and it, I'm so happy we got to do this because both of us were like, oh, I can't do it. I got some family issues, but you're you're doing well. Tell me anything else you want to promote. We had the movies. We know you well, get I you on Cameo. I'm put your mom in my prayers because I will pray my butt off from a big believer in God. He's number one to me, and I'll pray for your mom. I'll add it to my list of people. I will do the same for you. Uh, so I, I, you. I'm wrapping at this point, but we, you know, we could go as long as you want. But I, is there anything else we, we missed? I really enjoyed uh, our conversation. No, I'm good because I just want to. I'm going to chill out, but I, I can't wait till this comes out. And we'll text. We'll talk about audio off my, off my, You know what I mean? Text me. I mean, email me. I'm sorry. Text, email, this stuff. Whatever you want to do. All right. Well, that's uh, Mike Buschetti. Check him out. You're not on Twitter or anything, right? How do people get a hold of you? No, I got banned on Twitter actually. <laughs> What happened? How did that happen? Tell me, tell me that. And idiots were fighting with me, and I let them have it, and I forgot what I said, but it must have been real bad. It's like, I've been banned for two years on that now, over two years. Like Trump, you should just start your own social media network then. It'd probably be yeah, more successful. Uh, yeah. but anyway, Brad, but thank you so much for having me. I can't wait till this comes out. I thank you, sir, and I thank you for watching. This is Brad with uh, Here's the Pitch, sponsored by Masses Restaurants, Five Locations, stlmasses.com. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm going to have a big contest to get me to 10,000 subscribers. Mike's going to help, too. We'll see you next time.